Hello, everybody, and welcome to Siebert's webinar series. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. We greatly appreciate you being here and present. Today, we are hosting Jim Chestnut and Sam Johnson, who are going to talk about Max's Law, an evaluation of Max's Law that was done through the Oregon Health Authority, and they're going to share those results with us and some implications for those results. A few quick um, housekeeping items. One is if you have any tech questions or tech issues, if you look down at the bottom of your display screen, you can see a chat box um, that disappears when your cursor's not on it sometimes. So if you put your cursor down below, that'll pop up and you can ask us tech questions. We'll be monitoring that the whole time. So if you have sound issues or anything, let us know and we'll do our best to take care of it. And then if you look a little further to the right, there's two bubbles with a Q&A on them. That's where we want you to put your questions. So if you have questions for our, our speakers today, please type your questions in there and we'll do our best to make sure they all get answered and we will be moderating and facilitating those questions to um, Jim and Sam. Um, at the end of our session today, we're going to leave some time to have a discussion of the implementation of Max's Law and concussion management teams that you've experienced. Um, so there'll be a little time for that. That'll be separate from the Q&A. So on that note, I am going to introduce our speakers. First, we have Jim Chestnut. Jim is the medical director of the OHSU Sports Medicine Program. He was I'm sure he'll tell you more about himself, but he was instrumental in the creation and passing of Oregon's concussion law and is an original member of our OCAMP team, which is Oregon's Concussion Awareness and Management Program, among many other things you can see on, on his slide there. Um, Sam Johnson is an associate professor, professor at OH, OSU and an athletic trainer as well. He's also the board president of the Oregon Athletic Trainer Society, also known as OATS, um, and participates in many other um, boards and volunteer work that helps our kids. We greatly appreciate that. Um, Sam was also key in the passing of Oregon's new return to school law. He testified for us and did some vital work um, in terms of vetting vetting that. So we greatly appreciate that, Sam. And on that note, we'll let them take it away. Great. Uh, nice to be here. Um, Sam and I work together on a lot of projects, and so um, it's always fun to work together on a talk, but uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, <laughs> uh, coordinate this pretty well. So first of all, we're obviously talking about the implementation of Max's Law in Oregon uh, high schools, and this is a survey that that we perform. So um, we're going to go ahead and give a little background here and go next. Um, and uh, basically, you know, we were talking about concussions and the thing is about concussions is that they're going to happen if kids are active. We're trying to find ways to minimize the adverse outcomes from concussions and, and really come up with some uniform guidelines about how schools and healthcare providers uh, manage concussions. And so uh, our goal is to get, to have the, the athletes um, playing and, and healthy. Next. So uh, we did come up with a plan some years ago, probably in the 2008-2007 timeframe, um, where we started establishing statewide um, physician network and uh, uniform evaluation and management protocols. These were um, kind of vetted through the National uh, Federation of High School Sports and the OSAA. And uh, we um, started putting together, uh, even now, a more robust consultation service with athletic trainers. Uh, and um, you also utilize what we call the impact baseline testing. So there's a lot being done on the uh, kind of state and national level to help improve um, the management of concussions. But you know, it really took uh, state laws to, uh, to really make a big difference in how we manage them. Next. So, um, <clears throat> But first of all, this group, the OCAMP, is an organization that is multidisciplinary. And uh, the, the nicest thing about this group is it really shows how it takes a team to uh, adequately implement policy and to make a positive change in the public health arena. 
Uh, and I think we've been very fortunate to be able to collaborate with, um, say, Seabert and a number of organizations throughout the, the state that include educators, coaches, athletic directors, um, and also um, education specialists, and including the Oregon Department of Education. Most of this really has been done outside of any formal kind of state-run um, guidance or organization, and I think we've been fortunate to be able to make a big impact this way. Next. Uh, we do have um, kind of a, this is kind of a clinical in, uh, distribution here where we, we kind of cover different parts of the state with, uh, with different uh, medical groups here and, and then also some, some research. Um, Sam's group is not listed there because uh, he's not cl clinically involved uh, in this right now other than what he does in the schools, of course. But these are kind of like the, the clinical uh, regional concussion centers. Uh, there's a lot of other satellites, things going on, and, and actually, you know, it is true that the uh, folks at Oregon State are developing a great uh, program through the SAM Health and different things, too, and there are other areas in Portland, too, uh, that have great programs, and we're trying to develop some in Southern Oregon, too. But this is kind of the, the program here, and you all know about um, the concussion um, kind of advisory program through the schools uh, that Melissa put together. We're not going to talk about that, but there's other resources as well. Next. <clears throat> And so finally, we realizing, despite all this, we still were having difficulty um, making uh, um, headway in terms of, of uh, uniform protocols. So in 2009, we were able to uh, put together a consortium of people who were able to put together this uh, Max's Law. Um, this was, uh, it was actually the first state law on this that was uh, passed by the legislature. And then um, Washington, I think, had their governor sign it. Um, there's a little bit sooner, so their, their law was uh, signed by the governor sooner, and then we implemented them, you know, around the same time. So basically, Oregon and Washington were, were ahead of the game. This was effective in July 2009, and uh, Max Conrad uh, was the, the person we named this after because um, he was a young gentleman uh, quarterback who um, was basically concussed early in the week, <clears throat> and it was felt that he probably recovered, but there weren't any great guidelines about how long he should be out. And then later played that week in a game and then had multiple hits. And then finally, uh, by um, the end of the first half, he was out and um, basically in intensive care and in and, and variety of neurologic problems that have persisted even to this day. So in honor of that, and because his father was an active participant in this process, we were able to name it after Max, and he's participated in some of the, the early um, kind of implementation. But um, this is the basis of uh, the, the laws that have basically disseminated throughout the country, uh, through Oregon and Washington, and all the way through the country now. So what we'll be learning later is that we're basically doing an implementation uh, study of this law, and uh, th that's what we'll be hearing about later. The what we'll be finding out is that no same day return to play was the number one first thing. And that was the, again, the first states to implement that. Two, a medical release needed to return to play. And then the yearly coaches education that can still be found on the OSAA website, which I encourage you to go to. It's free to coaches or actually anybody who wants to take it. So it's, it's a good course. Next. <clears throat> Uh, this is Max in the middle with a with a blue tie on, and you know he looks great. And that is the somewhat the problem with a traumatic brain injury is that people with traumatic brain injury can look great and not actually feel good or function well. Uh, and so it's important that we acknowledge that that you know there are difficulties despite people feeling uh, well. I just want to acknowledge Dave Cracky on the, um, to the right of Max there, um, which is the left of your screen, and he's a lawyer who's been helpful. Um, you know, essential in basically crafting many of these laws. Uh, he helped this one, and he also has is now serving as uh, TBI um, li liaison um, and um, working with the uh, Seabert and uh, <clears throat> hopefully um, <clears throat> integrated into the state uh, uh, structure soon. And then uh, the Brain Injury Association of Tootie Smith and um, Sherry Stock have been incredibly helpful along the way. Next. Uh, again, uh, even though um, well, I told you about three of the concepts, these are the three kind of R's related, which was recognition, which is really um, a teaching and learning uh, opportunity uh, before, and then actually recognizing it. The next step is the action mode. We've got to remove that person from play. No same day return to play. The refer part is refer to medical professionals and educational professionals to adequately uh, treat the person until they're able to return and then go through a graded medical release, which we'll just briefly discuss on later. Next. 
So um, <clears throat> Washington uh, had a law called Zachary Lysted Law, very similar. And I just want to acknowledge Zachary Lysted and his family because uh, they also uh, were pioneers and uh, many of the state laws across the country uh, were kind of modeled, modeled after this. And, um, you know, the key concept, when in doubt, sit them out. And uh, they have a similar format uh, as well. The only difference they had was they were able to incorporate it into the use of public lands to have uh, competition and then and parents would have to sign a release uh, before their, uh, their student, uh, their child could play in competitions that uh, they were uh, a part of this. So a slightly different tack than the, uh, the Oregon law. Next, please. So one of the problems we ran into is we were realizing that in Oregon, the, our first law was mainly just focused around high school sports and did not include club sports. So um, there were a number of people that we'd see come in over and over that had uh, been participating on the weekends in club sports, or in this case, Jenna Sneva was a ski racer, a gold medal ski racer with more than 12 concussions. And it was, it was not clear that the guidelines were being implemented uh, uniformly in club sports, or, and so that's why this law was enacted in 2013. And um, uh, the, again, just to, to say, it does take a lot of legislatures that are willing to you know, step forward and do and, and uh, help this, um, and, I, and we wanna applaud them as well. Jen in the center um, has become an advocate for brain injury awareness, and she shared her story online as well. And uh, fortunately, you know, she was able to go back and complete college and, and uh, work uh, also in an area that helps um, traumatic brain injury as well. So what's new in 2018 was one of the things I just want to say in 2000, um, the Senate Bill 217 uh, was add uh, naturopath, chiropractors, physical therapists to clear uh, mild traumatic brain injury. We had hoped to get athletic trainers uh, on that list as well. Um, and uh, that did not occur, but athletic trainers, as, we, as you'll learn, are at the uh, core of uh, treatment of, the, of this. And we'll see later the, that there's an education program we need to do as well, uh, provide as well. Next, please. Uh, this or the expanded Oregon concussion law um, was, um, was basically to try to increase access to uh, students across the state to different providers. Uh, naturopathic doctors are uh, primary care doctors. Um, across the state and chiropractors serve um, in similar um, capacities. And so um, um, both those professional groups and patients um, were interested in expanding the list. And so the, the list has been expanded, including physical therapists, occupational therapists as well. Um, and uh, the previous list was the MDDO, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and psychologists who will continue to be uh, certified providers. And then part of the law was that the OHSU program was supposed to provide an educational program, which should be uh, rolling out um, soon. Next slide. Um, this is actually be starting July 1st, and um, it, uh, it's a collaboration with a number of uh, groups um, across the state, including the OSAA uh, as well, and um, Sam's um, helping to provide some about the athletic trainers, et cetera. So that, that you can find that later. We can give you information about that if you're interested. Next. So uh, back to Max's Law, we uh, as OCAMP and, and subsequently Siebert's basically been the lead agency for, for that, um, has put together this Max's Law uh, Concussion Management Implementation Guide, which now also includes Jenna's Law. And so there's a lot of information about how to actually implement this. And so we're not going to go through this extensively, but uh, next page. Uh, this does show that the core of this implementation program is a concussion management team. And we'll talk more about that, but it includes multidisciplinary groups across the, um, uh, the school and the community, and then also implementation of uh, supports for academic um, uh, accommodations and, and, um, and, and different, there's different terms that can be used, but basically one of the core concepts we always get around to if people have persistent problems is a 504 plan. And um, we can chat more about that uh, at the end as well. Next slide. One of the things just to highlight is that uh, along the same time here, we actually um, had um, the governor's task force on traumatic brain injury form, which is one of the, which I uh, participated in. And we had some, um, some recommendations come out about that as well. Uh, next page. 
And this basically shows the recommendations that came out, um, uh, increase educational outreach. So this could be done through the schools as well, uh, as well as for other age groups. Establish a TBI clinical registry, which we don't have, hopefully we'll have. Kind of help uh, provide a roadmap for services and resources, which are currently being looked at. Establish a statewide program for care coordinators and uh, equitable system of care and delivery. These are all kind of care and uh, care coordination. And so uh, in order to do that, the number eight is what we feel is one of the most important guidelines is to establish the governor's traumatic brain injury coordinator uh, advocate in the office of the governor or thereabouts. And so fortunately, we've been able to uh, position that uh, in CBER right now and hoping to transition that to the state governor. Again, Dave Cracky is currently serving in that role. Next. Well, um, <clears throat> in understanding the concepts of, of you know, Max's law, we also have to cons consider what does what return to play mean and look like. And so um, this is the current guideline uh, when we put in perspective of how, how the Max's law is being implemented is that, you know, this is a new guideline after Max's law was implemented, but Max's law doesn't prescribe a specific return to play process. They just say that you need medical clearance uh, to go back. And so hopefully we're trying to make sure that, you know, the state uses a, a standard return to play protocol that's generally instituted through the OSAA uh, program, uh, but also medical providers need to be aware of this. And so that's part of our education. But basically the newest aspect of return to play is the stage one is now symptom limited activity, which allows people to be active uh, with daily activities that do not increase uh, symptoms. So after about one or two days of rest, they can they can move on and and become active pretty early on. We used to have people rest for multiple days. So so that's part of the problem is as we evaluate the program, we also need to realize that some of the policies and some of the return to play guidelines are changing during the same time. Uh, there is a medical as you looked under number five, full contact practice requires medical clearance, can participate in normal training activities, but it requires medical clearance at the full contact practice and before they go back to full contact play. So that's a medical evaluation that signs off. Next slide. <clears throat> this is just an overview of the form and uh, next slide. I think is it'll just show that the front here, the top part, and this is on the OSA website, which we're currently um, updating this form as well to, to meet the new guidelines. But basically, so that athletic trainers or other coaches or others can, can document the initial injury. Next slide. And then we have the stepwise uh, return to play, which again is need to be modified. But the bottom section is where providers can uh, annotate what um, is the stage which they need to return to school and, and, and things like that. Um, so this form is important. It's, it's required that there be a form, but not required that you use this exact form. Each school can have their own uh, return to play form, and, but they should have a policy. Next slide. <clears throat> Also, return to academics, which many of you are probably very aware of and, and help implement in schools, which is basically goes back to this recognize, um, which is the concussion management team identifies a student uh, with a concussion and uh, they're removed and they remain home for maybe a couple days. They don't have to be two days, but more than two days is probably not helpful for the recovery. And then referring is um, um, just um, referring him to get to this process where the concussion management team can get him back into a return to academic plan with accommodations or adjustments or modified uh, schoolwork. And they should be back to school before back to athletics. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to go over this extensively, but you all know the Seabird has done great work uh, putting this together. Some of us participated in developing this, this uh, project for return to academics that the OSAA has adopted as well. And so we want to make sure um, this is incorporated in the future, but Max's law did not specifically have a return to academic uh, portion. Next slide. So finally, um, I'm just going to introduce this subject and hand off to Sam here pretty soon, but um, uh, the website is on the bottom here, and I encourage you to look at the whole uh, survey. Um, this was technically, uh, well, it was, it was uh, undertaken in, in May of 2019, and we just re released it to the public, though, um, just uh, this last month. So it's a brand new uh, implementation guide. Next slide. Uh, these are the uh, individuals that participated in putting together the report and um, uh, some of us were involved in different stages of it, uh, but basically the uh, Oregon Health Authority 
uh, was basically the organization that um, was able to garner some funds and um, they were able to um, get this group together and led by Laura Chisholm, Matt Laidler, uh, Susan uh, Van Hoff and, and then David Dowler and I got to give him the most credit because he actually did most of the work uh, writing the report and doing the an analytic work and of course uh, Sam and Glang, Melissa, uh, Peter Weber was essential from the OSAA in helping coordinate um, the actual um, d um, distribution of the questionnaire and of course his input's always uh, incredibly helpful. Um, and then we want to thank, of course, all the people who responded, which, um, as you'll see here in a minute, was a, was a quite uh, an impressive uh, response rate. Next slide. And the only reason I'm putting up this here, I just want to acknowledge the funding sources because that's always important. As you see, the CDC, uh, you know, Violence and Injury Prevention Program was the core um, group here, and uh, and we're, we've been fortunate to have funds, and hopefully we'll be able to garner some more funds for similar work. Next slide. Okay, and I'm just going to introduce this, maybe a couple more slides, maybe Sam, if you want to jump in at some point, but um, just to reiterate, these were the three concepts of Max's Law, which I told you about, which is training, which is the annual training of coaches and recognition of symptoms, the removal, um, and that's the important part, to remove them until they've gone through clearance, and, uh, and so that's part of the core thing. Next slide. And, uh, and I'll just introduce this, uh, which was also that there were um, uh, a lot of responses. There was 170 respondent, which is great, uh, which is about almost a 60% response rate. Um, and, uh, and so we were very fortunate that the athletic uh, directors were um, responded and participated. Next slide. Okay, so what I'd like to do is pass off to Sam. He, uh, we, you know, he, uh, he's a, uh, professor at Oregon State and very analytical and uh, he's uh, I think you're going to enjoy his his take on this about looking through this report and coming up with some of the most salient points and uh, hopefully those, those will uh, generate questions on your part so that we can have a discussion here um, at the end of our discussion. Thanks Jim and uh, thanks uh, Siebert for having me uh, to join in this webinar. Um, we felt it'd be important to take a little deeper dive into the data. Uh, so we'll take a deep dive and then kind of pull back out and uh, give a higher level overview. I, I do want to, you know, go back on the previous slide where we talked about we had about a 60% uh, response rate. Um, and I think, you know, that's a, pr that's a pretty high response rate for a survey, especially a survey where we're asking if people are following a law. Uh, you know, a lot of people are very cautious of, of responding, but I think that w the reason I want to uh, highlight it is it really shows uh, we partnered with OSAA on this, uh, and it shows the, the the reach OSAA has to get to the schools. Um, and I also think it shows how important the partnership is between the OSAA, Seabird, uh, you know, and all these other different uh, stakeholder groups. Uh, I think it's really. Um, you know, talking to colleagues in other states, this isn't happening everywhere where we're all working together to try and improve the health and safety of the kids. So I think we should be really proud of that in Oregon. Uh, we still have work to do, but I think we're, we're making progress. And so hopefully the, the data today will uh, highlight that. Uh, so one of the first questions we asked was just how familiar are you with Max's law? And you can see uh, pretty much everyone says they're familiar with it. And, you know, I'm, you know, 62% saying very familiar. And I think a lot of that credit goes to OCAMP. Uh, you know, the, the work they did in that implementation guide, it was really important. Um, and, and it's still very salient today. So uh, hopefully we can continue to promote that uh, moving forward because there's some very important information in there. So then we started to kind of ask questions about, you know, how many of you are incorporating the law? And really what incorporation of the law really was, what we were trying to get with that was, do you have a policy in place uh, for training, removal, and clearance? Um, and all the schools said yes, uh, or all the athletic directors that responded said their schools had, uh, you know, there was some sort of, uh, we're requiring training, we're removing kids when they have a concussion, and we're requiring clearance before they return to play. So that's great that they have the protocol in place or, you know, a policy in place, but we also want to know, are you actually using it? Um, and so we, to have a proxy of that, uh, we ask in the past 12 months, uh, has the following happened? Did the coaches receive training? 
Uh, did the student athlete, any student athletes that were suspected of concussions, they were removed immediately and healthcare provider uh, was uh, provided clearance. And you can see, you know, the, the numbers are pretty positive there that all of the time are all above 90%. And then most of the time, I left off the others where some of the time, uh, not at all, because they were all zero. Um, and so I think, you know, th that's a good sign that not only do these schools have these policies in place, but they're also implementing them um, and, and using them. And I think that's an important thing when, when, whenever we evaluate policy, too often we stop at, do you have the policy versus, do you have the policy and are you actually implementing the policy? Um, and so I, I think that's a, an important point, but it's, it's a positive finding that we have here um, re related to Max's law. Um, so then we really wanted to dig in and ask about barriers to implementing the law. And so the next few slides really dig into each uh, training, removal, and clearance. So the first one is barriers uh, to coach training. And as a group, we kind of looked at to see, okay, well, what are some of the barriers that we suspect? And we gave them the option to select multiple, uh, was it lack of time, lack of funding, lack of awareness? Uh, lack of interest or lack of district support. And I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's a positive finding that, uh, you know, most of them said that not a challenge, uh, all over 50%. Uh, but the two that kind of struck out, uh, stuck out to us as a group when we were looking at these is that the, the moderate challenges were lack of time um, and lack of interest. Um, you know, lack of time is always a hard one because no matter what we do, we're not going to give more people uh, more hours of their day to do something. I know we're asking more and more of, uh, you know, people, you know, in terms of asking coaches to do more training, uh, things like that. And so um, it, it just becomes, you know, from changing a lack of time to we had to make this a priority. Uh, but again, at 14 percent, you know, or you know, really 16 percent where we see that as a large or moderate challenge, you know, th that's still, you know, a small number that's reporting that. And lack of interest, that was lack of interest by the coaches. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, coaches don't want to talk about, uh, you know, concussions. Um, you know, they probably want to dig in and talk about, you know, what sport they're coaching and, and, and things related to that. Uh, but again, those numbers, uh, you know, I think we have some areas to try to improve it, but it's not, um, I'm not overly troubled by those numbers. We also asked them what other challenges, and so this was like an open-ended question. Um, and these are just presented as, um, the totals that answer, you know, that, that put this, well, so we ask, so we just looked at the totals and then we uh, grouped them by themes. Uh, so these weren't specific, uh, you know, quotes that we're giving them. There's a couple examples later on where there will be some quotes, uh, uh, but really about, you know, uh, uh, there was 84 people that responded to this question, um, you know, 40, 40 said none. And then, then, then we kind of grouped these together. Um, you know, some of the challenges were they had to continually remind the coaches, um, you know, that is difficult for non-school based coaches. We're seeing that more and more that coaches that aren't school employees are coming in uh, to serve as coaches. Uh, that is a burden for coaches. And then a few said watching the same video every year. In Oregon, it is required they uh, complete the uh, training yearly and it is the same video. Um, and so, you know, that's just um, from a, um, an efficiency standpoint, that's just the way we, we've set it up. And then, and then there were seven other comments that we're not going to dig into. Um, when, we, when we talk about the challenges for removal from participation, we really didn't know what we, we were going to get. Uh, so we didn't come up with preset challenges. Um, and so we just asked open-ended question, you know, and again, 40 of them said there was no challenges to, to removal from participation. Um, but then, you know, they did report that, you know, student athletes not communicating or wanting to stop playing, which isn't surprising. There's a lot of data out there to, uh, that highlights that uh, and concerns and trying interventions to try to counter that. Uh, coaches not following protocols or lacking knowledge. Uh, so there was nine that responded to that. Um, a lack of staffing, including, you know, multiple individuals, right? And they, they did not have an athletic trainer. We know that only about half the schools in uh, half the high schools in Oregon have access to an athletic trainer. Uh, and then parents lacking understanding or supporting protocols. So, you know, if we kind of uh, look at those, several of those are related to education. Uh, several, several of those are related to funding and, and the appropriate staffing. So uh, we do have some work to do. Uh, we can keep working on the education piece um, and trying to uh, promote more athletic trainers and healthcare providers available in the schools. We know that's going to be a significant challenge with the coming uh, budget crisis, but it's something I think we need to continue to advocate for. And I say that from a very biased perspective as an athletic trainer, but I wouldn't say that if I didn't think that athletic trainers in the schools are providing a vital role uh, serving with the other healthcare providers and administ educators and administrators. 
Um, and then noted challenges to implementing return to play clearance. Uh, so the, the, uh, there was a little bit more, I mean, not, the number of responding was still about the same, right around you know, 79 here, the other ones were 80 and 84. Um, but th there was a little more variation. Um, so th th there was noted that, you know, about 13 of them said their parents had a lack of understanding, you know, several of them said the students had a lack of understanding, which is a little different than, you know, not you know, what we saw on the previous slide, but, uh, you know, still there's just some education that can happen. Uh, healthcare provider, uh, lack of training or knowledge. Um, and, and that actually comes up a little bit later, uh, you know, at the bottom there where it says, it's right above other where it says, it's important to rely on the athletic trainer's judgment, including athletic trainers having a more conservative approach than community providers. Uh, so this idea that, you know, some of the healthcare providers that may be providing clearance don't truly understand uh, concussions and the return to play process. And that's one thing, you know, when, when Jim put together that uh, training program that starts this summer, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll address some of that. Um, the communication between the schools, parents, and other healthcare providers uh, was also a challenge that was noted. Uh, I think we all know that. I mean, there's a lot of uh, entities that are involved in this. Um, and, and so the more we can try to connect these groups, uh, the better. I think maybe when we have a chance to discuss here towards the end, maybe we can discuss, you know, what are ideas that we can, uh, that are people are using to get everyone on board. Um, and then, you know, the families facing financial burdens, like accessing uh, healthcare providers. Um, you know, that actually comes up. We asked us a very specific question uh, related to that, and so I'll jump to that right now. We wanted, we were really curious about this. Uh, wanted to know how many student athletes did have access, have challenges accessing a provider to provide return to play clearance. Uh, when the update to Max's law was passed in 2018, that kept coming up that you know that there wasn't enough access, and that's why we needed to expand the list to um, the other healthcare professions. And, and so we wanted to put that in there just to see, you know, whether schools were saying the same thing. Uh, and interestingly, in about, you know, just under half of them said that at some points, those, uh, the student athletes are uh, having trouble accessing, um, uh, accessing care. Um, and, and I think if you, those of you that are, you know, understand public health, that's probably not a common accessing care is a big problem. Um, you know, but when it comes to concussion, I think this is uh, interesting data that's, you know, I haven't seen reported before. And so things that we can all do to try to help uh, support that, um, you know, helping those kids get into, to the provider to be able to provide, to provide the clearance. Um, so time kind of taken together, um, you know, I think the things that were unique here is that 100% said they have protocols in place uh, and about 90% said they're actually implementing the protocols. And then just under half of the respondents were uh, noted, um, you know, trouble accessing care uh, or the students are having ac trouble accessing care to uh, receive clearance. Uh, so that's a pretty high number and so things to think about. Uh, and then we look at the, you know, the keys that were kind of highlighted in the law, uh, you know, training, you know, lack of time of interest, you know, a small number putting that. Uh, removal, you know, the, the idea that there's this the communication between uh, the athlete and the coach and the lack of knowledge and, and follow throughs, things we continue to work on. Um, and then the last part is clearance, um, you know, just that you know, the lack of understanding of the students, the parents, lack of training by the health providers, and then and the communication between all the different entities. So that's the main part of where we ask about the law itself and, and, and whether people were following the law. Uh, but the other thing we were really interested in with this report and this survey was trying to get a sense of what were people doing in terms of other best practices. Uh, for example, Jim talked about the uh, having concussion management teams or following a, a, a a progressive or graduated return to play uh, protocol. Neither of those things are in statute, um, but they are best practiced uh, or best practice recommendations. And we really wanted to know, are people doing it or not? You know, kind of what's the carryover from, you know, you have a law that mandates certain things, but then you know, what else is happening? Um, you know, that's kind of subsequent to that or in uh, conjunction with that. And so we asked, did, you know, do you have a concussion management protocol? Um, you know, overwhelmingly they said, yes, they do have a concussion management pro protocol. Uh, so that's a, a very positive sign. Uh, we, don't, we didn't ask what that protocol was. That'd be interesting to be able to dig into to see, is it just what the OSAA provides? Do the schools have their own protocols? Uh, what does it look like? Uh, do they use a, re a graduated return to play protocol? And again, overwhelmingly the school said, yes, we are using this uh, uh, a protocol. We didn't ask which specific one, uh, whether it is the one that we that Jim highlighted, which is recommended by the 
um, international like, group that put that out, um, but they are using some sort of uh, graduated return to play protocol. So that's a positive sign. Then we ask, uh, are you using graduated return to learn protocol? Um, and the numbers are you know, lower here. Uh, I, I still think 83% is positive, is, but, we, but it also says we have room to improve. Uh, what we hope is that with the passage of, in the most recent short session of the return to learn um, academic accommodations um, form that's going to be required, or that's going to be developed by ODE um, in the next couple of years, hopefully that number will uh, significantly <laughs> increase and get closer to 100%. It's going to take some education, though. It's going to take some work on all of our parts to make sure schools are on board with that. Um, and also engage in the process as this form is developed. So it's actually uh, a form that uh, can be used. Um, and then we want to know about concussion management teams. Obviously, this is uh, uh, something that Seabird and uh, the other groups have really advocated for. It's a, I think it's a topic that uh, is probably under-recognized and then, you know, the need for it. Um, and, and you can see that you know, only 29% of schools said they had a concussion management team. Um, so not a real high number. Uh, so I, I, we definitely have some work to do there. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that kind of at the end about what that might look like. Um, and then we said, if you do have a concussion management team, how often does it meet? Um, so I think it's pretty striking there that, um, you know, not very many of them have a team and those that do not very many of them are, are meeting regularly. Um, so, um, it's, you can have, you know, I think that doesn't meet, you know, that uh, almost a third of them are saying we, do, we have a team, but they don't meet. And so I guess I, I would kind of question, you know, what's the utility of that uh, management team? Uh, is other things being done? I, I don't know, really know. Uh, so maybe uh, we can have that as part of our discussion of what that might look like uh, or what it's looking like in, in the schools as these teams are being developed. What challenges are we having to develop the teams? And then what are the challenges to actually getting these teams to be a functioning team? Um, we wanted to know who had received uh, concussion training, um, concussion recognition and management training in the past 12 months. Uh, and so this would be on coaches. We really wanted to know, uh, you know, our student, are, are you training student athletes? What about parents? And what about other school staff? Um, you know, about 40% said they were not doing it. They didn't know if they were doing it. It was unsure. Uh, you know, about 33% were saying uh, student athletes uh, were about 20% saying the parents were getting the training. And then about 43% were saying the school staff was also getting trained. I think one thing to kind of keep in mind here, uh, and this is one challenge we had when we developed this survey, is that uh, Max's law does not, it, Max's law requires the schools to ensure that coaches are trained. Uh, Jenna's law, which covers private schools and other youth sports, uh, does, uh, it, it, it has a provision that uh, parents um, also have, parents and athletes also have to be educated on. Uh, concussion recognition. Um, and so that's one thing I haven't separated this out uh, from private schools to public schools to see uh, see what it is. If we ever want to do a deeper dive into this data, we probably want to separate it out because it could be a, a little bit of a confounding factor there. Uh, so to kind of recap this, uh, you know, the large majority when we talk about these best practice recommendations are they have concussion management protocols, they have return to play protocols, and they have return to learn protocols. So that's really good. Uh, but when we start looking at what is, you know, where there are some gaps, it's um, providing training for the staff and coaches, conducting, uh, and, and the parents, and then really the active concussion management team. Um, and so th those are kind of the take home uh, messages. So I want to end here kind of with uh, these recommendations. And uh, so these are the recommendations from the report. Uh, Jim, feel free to jump in at any time um, on these. Uh, but obviously, you know, continued coordination and strategic planning with stakeholders to support school efforts and concussion management. Um, we know that's hard, uh, just, you know, with all the different entities from, uh, from the school-based personnel to the community-based personnel to the parents. Um, so, you know, coming up with strategies that we can all use and try to, um, you know, get support will be important. Uh, you know, support schools and overcoming barriers to training coaches. Uh, we continue to talk about this from the, at the OSAA Sports Medicine Advisory Committee. We have a great relationship with the Coaches Association and the Athletic Directors Association. Uh, they are huge advocates for sports safety. Uh, and so we continue to discuss how we can uh, better serve the coaches because we know they play such an integral role in uh, recognizing, uh, in recognizing the concussion, but also supporting those student athletes uh, during the return to play process. Uh, 
and in schools that don't have an athletic trainer may actually be doing some of the return to play uh, 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 protocol steps, you know, put, putting those steps into place. Uh, provide uh, resources and raise awareness among healthcare providers. Uh, you know, Jim's course will hopefully do some of that. I think we still have some work to do because that course will only be required for some of the healthcare professions, not all of them. Uh, and then, you know, methods to improve training for parents and students. We saw that as an issue. Uh, just overall improve concussion management training uh, and provide resources and guidance to help schools develop robust concussion management teams. So quite a bit there. Uh, some probably have bigger needs than others. Um, you know, so I don't know, Jim, if you want to add anything in regarding the recommendations. Yeah, hi Sam, that was great. Um, well, you know, the recommendations I think are all important and uh, the only challenge you always come up with is, um, you know, how do we actually develop those who funds them, you know, and then, you know, who's going to actually take the courses and, um, I think the OSA course is a is a really good course, and uh, you know it'd be nice to change it up a little bit. But the coaches actually change quite a bit anyway. So, you know, as it as it as the case may be, they sometimes move around the state, but they also change it out. So, um, anyway, um, there is controversy about that. I do think it'd be nice to have a little more training for the parents uh, as well as the students, and that's something that we probably need to keep looking at as well. But um, I do encourage you to go to the uh, website. It's a it's a very nice um, document that the, uh, the OHA put together, and uh, it's actually hosted on their uh, prevention and wellness um, site as well. So you, if you search on the web, you might find their the actual website itself, which is good. But this just takes you just to the, the PDF document. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing. If you do want to dig into the to the report, it is broken down by uh, OSA classification, public school, private schools, uh, charter schools. Um, it also is broken down by uh, urban, uh, large rural, and small rural uh, communities based on some demographic data that was available. Uh, I just didn't want to go into that uh, deep, kind of look at more of a higher level overview of all the schools uh, combined. But in case you're interested, there's a lot more in the in the document. Yeah, and one thing more thing I'll say about that aspect is that uh, one of the goals of um, the uh, state concussion uh, advocate position is to uh, and Seabird and uh, OCamp is to help improve concussion um, education and management guidance to the rural parts of Oregon and, and some of the underserved uh, areas as well. So um, that's why we wanted to ask that question so we'd get some information um, and maybe at some point, um, you know, Dave Cracky or, or Melissa could talk a little bit more about those efforts as we further develop them. Yeah, and so really the last few slides I have, you know, we wanted to kind of end with this and this idea because it, it did seem like this was one of the themes that came up in the, um, from the results is, you know, these lack of concussion management teams, uh, lack of communication between the different entities. And so I just, you know, we came up with this idea of this, you know, who are our key stakeholders? Uh, obviously the athletes in the middle. I mean, I think all of us agree that's the, uh, the, the person that we are uh, most concerned about and where our attention needs to be uh, focused. Um, you know, and so I put, you know, educators and administrators, you know, at the top. I mean, I think, you know, you serve a critical role in the schools of, you know, not only ensuring that the, you know, as athletic trainer, I think we talk about, oh, we want them back to play. But I think, you know, return to learn is, you know, probably even more. I think we can all agree that's probably more important. And I think it's something we hear, we keep saying as athletic trainers, like, yeah, it's, you know, get them back to sport, get them back to activity. But we need to also assist them getting back into the classroom. Um, you know, because that's why they're going to school. Uh, so the educators and administrators play, you know, obviously an essential role. I already mentioned about the coaches, uh, the school based healthcare providers. Um, you know, again, essential, I think, is more and more is falling on the schools related to healthcare. Um, you know, we have an opportunity. It's also a lot of challenges related to that. Uh, but I think we need to continue to work together, you know, from athletic trainers, school nurses, uh, school psychologists, if the school is uh, speech language pathologists, anybody, we all need to work together. Uh, and then the community based healthcare providers, uh, obviously, they're the ones that are going to be providing clearance and return to play. Um, and then parents or guardians. And I, you know, I just want to add one more piece in here because this is something we've been trying to highlight to uh, the coaches, the athletic directors, 
about Max's law, and it's kind of skimmed over every in some circles, is that the requirement of the law says they need to, the athlete needs to have clearance from a qualified healthcare provider, but it also says they need to be free of any signs, symptoms, uh, and behaviors of a concussion, which would make sense, right? If they're, but that part gets glossed over. Uh, sometimes schools will just say, well, I have a medical release form, they should be, they can go back in. And we hear that from parents. Well, the doctor signed um, the form. Why can't they go back in? So this, it's, it, the schools do have a responsibility to ensure that not only do they have the form, but that the, the uh, student athlete is ready to go back into play. And there has actually been, there was a case in Washington where uh, a school was sued uh, for that reason that they had a form, but the athlete wasn't. Uh, cleared to we didn't have, still have signs and symptoms. So I think it's something that I, I keep kind of beating that drum to make sure everyone's aware. It's a really a two-step process. It's not just having the release form. It's the release form and they're really ready to go back in uh, to return to play. Yeah. Um, Can I just uh, yeah. um, break in? And so some of the schools actually have policies by which the, um, the local athletic trainer or team physician um, has final kind of um, clearance even after those forms uh, come in from community providers. Um, and it still is, the law still does state, like you said, if they have signs or symptoms of concussion, which could occur during the return to play process of increased exertion or something that they need to be excluded. And so even the referee or the coach uh, could, or, or ideally an athletic trainer involved would be able to identify that and then would exclude them, even if they had a signed release there because it's really at the time that they're going into play it's you know it could have been they were seen even a day or two ago by the um, medical provider so anyway well, let's send that back to Sam yeah and so really our last slide uh, well last two slides here um, you know just some references from Siebert uh, you know just you know assembling a concussion management team um, you know I think it's you know a lot more detail we kind of took a little higher over over higher level overview of those um, but, you know, just, just to highlight you know, the effort Siebert's done and the resources they have available, it's quite often that we are referring people to the Siebert website. So um, you know, it's, you know, kudos to them for all the work they do in this and keeping this, uh, you know, keeping this on the forefront, but also keeping this topic on the forefront, but also providing resources for the people that are really in the trenches doing the work on it. Um, and then just, you know, what should the protocol uh, really ensure? Um, and I'm not going to go through these. I think we wanted to leave some time for discussion about either the report, uh, other challenges that school, you know, people are having related to setting up these teams, setting up anything or anything about the, you know, um, the law or just concussion uh, management in general. So I think we were saying if you had questions, maybe just put them in the Q&A and um, we can maybe have a discussion. So Sam, I have been uh, answering some of the questions as they came up. So mm -hmm. for those of you who can see the Q&A box, which should be everybody, if you go into that and look at answered questions, there are a couple questions that were good questions um, that I put links up for. So one is, where can I find the video for coaches? So there's a link there for that video. There's also somebody asked where they can find the Max's Law Guide. Um, there's a link provided in the chat for the Max's Law Guide. Um, somebody asked if the, this is being recorded and if we're gonna send out slides. And yes, that is accurate. We'll be recording and posting and sending slides. Um, other than that, I don't see any other questions. Um, David Cracky says hi to Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, and, they, yeah. and he also said that he, I guess he said that he would be willing to help provide um, kind of some of the guidance and approaches around helping to serve some of the more rural and underserved community in the state. Yeah, he's been doing a lot of work on that. So, um, and Dave, we might have to get you to talk about that sometime soon. So here's here's a question: How do you deal with a player who has a return to play document, but is still showing signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with a concussion. So I think referencing what Sam was talking about is that they've been cleared by the medical provider, but but still symptomatic. Yeah, Jim, do you want to start with that? I think you kind of made the comment about schools having policies. Sure, I could comment on that. <clears throat> um, 
Well, it depends. Not every school has a policy like that, but I think the problem is that um, you know I'm a you know as a medical provider, I I can be the person to acknowledge that not all medical providers understand concussions equally, um, and so it, it would be a great example for me to say this, which we joke about, and sometimes our committees because we have a dermatologist on our one committee he says. I'm really good at the derm stuff. I'm not really good at the cardiology or at the, well, cardiology or um, the concussion stuff. And so, I mean, I'm trying not to sign off on any concussions, right? But there are there is a possibility that a provider who may have very little knowledge or maybe just wanted to help that student in good um, kind of good faith or whatever, say, "Oh, I'll help you sign this off so you can play," but not necessarily know how to actually do that. So it can happen that you can have a provider who either doesn't know much about it or has kind of say maybe connection to a family who wants to help them out. Or you might have a parent as well that might be signing off. And, and then in those situations, um, we just, well, first of all, every athletic trainer knows that they have to also test those athletes with kind of like an exertion and things like that and, and have, and watch them closely as they go back to play. Cause while they're exerting, they, they may, um, show signs of a concussion still, or they could get a very minor hit on their very first time back in and they could show signs of concussion again with a smaller hit. So they, they're very cognizant of the fact that they may need to reevaluate them even if they've been cleared. And I think that's an important point that we have to consider. Yeah, I don't know if I have a great answer. I mean, I think having a policy in place is very, is helpful to fall back on, but even so there's the state law that we had to fall back on. So I think it's empowering whether schools have athletic trainers uh, or, uh, you know, coaches that they're the ones that are going to be doing or administrators that, you know, that's part of it. And you kind of saw that in, in the results that, you know, several, you know, I think it was several of the respondents reported that there's this lack, lack of agreement between what the community providers saying and what, the athletic trainer at the school saying, and with the athletic trainer being more conservative, which I interpret as they're, they're getting this released when they're not ready to be released. Um, and so I think it's just more education. And I kind of see that, you know, in, in the Q&A, there's a question about, um, you know, from a return to learn perspective, you know, that the community, you know, the primary care provider is not up to date on TBI care and write notes to excuse students for a week from school. You know, what's the best way to help get that, uh, information up to get them up to date. And I think that's, that's a huge challenge, right? I mean, I think it's, you know, other states have tried different things, different education tactics, and I'm not sure they've been overly successful. Um, you know, with the new concussion, with the new providers coming on the require, I mean, it's in statute that they're going to have to do some sort of um, training. Um, I don't know, Jim, what's been your experience related to making sure that um, medical providers are up to speed not just on you know return to play, but also on return to learn. Well, the return to learn, the the I think the best thing that we've been able to do is to coordinate with Seabird and then uh, with numbers from the OSA group too. We've been able to um, agree on some of the return to learn principles, and those are all listed on the OSA website. Um, the easiest way to get there is to go to OSA and go on health and safety. And then from health and safety, click on to uh, maybe, I don't know, Melissa, can you share your screen and show that? Show the OSAA. Yeah, if you get health and safety, it's kind of nice just for people to see where that OSAA, and and so all of the uh, principles are listed there. We have all the kind of the, so I, I'd like people to rely on the OSAA website as kind of, at least for, for the state of Oregon, the things that I recommend. Maybe we can get to that at the end or whatever, but um, so the, and the problem is we we can't, as the OSA or through this course we're providing, um, provide certification of of you know of competence. All we can do is you know document that we expose people to guidelines and and uh, also to um, state laws, and then hopefully that will and, and to resources. And so here are the resources that you see here. <clears throat> There's a lot of resources on this website. It really is the most accessible one in many ways to um, to people from the schools other than the Seabert website. So all we can do is expose people, let them know where the resources are, but there's no way we can document competency. Um, you know, we have a sports medicine fellowship program that primary care physicians go through that's uh, at least a year long, sometimes it's two years long. And during that time, um, the 
the physicians are are uh, you know certified that they have competencies in concussion care. Athletic trainers have similar um, requirements, and maybe you could speak to those, Sam. And there are some other groups that do that. Sometimes the uh, but everybody has a like a slightly different requirements for their competence. Well, they're they're not even competencies, but just for their uh, educational program. So. Maybe Sam, you could speak a little bit to the educational requirements for athletic trainers. That'd be helpful. Yeah, I'll do that. And, and uh, I guess one thing before I do that, though, since we have this uh, yeah. the website up uh, on the right there, the second bullet point where it says "Oats Concussion for Schools Without Athletic Trainer," that actually links to a YouTube video, of, especially in youth athletes, uh, that we put together in common in, in collaboration with the coaches association and the OCA. One of the things we were hearing was that uh, schools without an athletic trainer were having a challenging time working through the return to play process and what exercises would be appropriate, what activities would be appropriate. Um, and so we, we developed this, you know, a really short video that uh, coaches or administrators, whoever is responsible for uh, running this protocol could use this as a resource. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that as something we were trying to do that, because um, we know there is this gap of about half the schools don't have an athlete trainer. Um, so what can we do to help them? Yeah, um, I would say that for those of you to an answer that question a little bit about medical providers or other providers who are not up to date, one of the things we try to do at Siebert with our resources is if we know of somebody who or a group that's out of date, we gently reach out and provide information. So, um, you know, without telling on someone per se, let us know if there's people who need to be reached out to who, who need the resources, need the training, whatever, and we'll gently offer to provide resources for folks, so. Could you pop back to the OSA one again, just so we don't yeah. actually get on something else there? <laughs> um, but also, um, yeah, and and uh, yeah, that's great. Seabird does a great job. And as you see, we have all the Seabird information on there. Um, we have the OSA return to participation form, which we're updating, return to uh, learn and, um, and different aspects there, as well as some national guidelines from the National Federation of High School Sports, CDC uh, fact sheets, and their Heads Up program is, is also uh, very, very good as well. You know, I see, we're, I know we're close to being out of time, but there's a couple of questions I think related, you know, that I'm reading them that are related to impact testing, uh, you know, whether, you know, they uh, uh, the student athlete has Clearance from the physician, but the impact test uh, doesn't meet baseline. And then there's another question about what about students skewing the baseline data? Um, I think that's you know always a concern. Uh, hopefully, whoever's reviewing the impact test is you know looking for that when they're reviewing the baseline results. Uh, but also, I think we can't fall back at, on the impact being the only diagnostic tool that we're using. Obviously, we know that's a, cha it's a challenge not having diagnostic tools uh, for concussions, but it's one piece of the puzzle. Um, and so we have to use our clinical judgment and other other tests and other physical exams that we're using to do that. So I don't know, Jim, uh, I know you have some thoughts yeah. on the impact test, but... Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. We use it as a, as a single tool and um, it's helpful, I think, in many ways. Um, it, but it's not the sole thing, but certainly an athletic trainer on site who's seeing a player uh, does does um, have up to date um, knowledge of how the athlete's doing. So even if they have a signed release in in place, or if they don't have a past impact test, I mean, there's a lot of challenges there for sure. Um, but I do want to highlight the training of athletic trainers uh, also in concussion. Uh, there's a core competencies and required education every year, right, Sam, and things like that. Yeah. So uh, there there are. Um, Part of it is in our entry level athletic trainers entry level standards. It's very detailed. Probably some of the most detailed other than probably sports medicine trained physicians and neurologists yeah. related to concussions. Um, but also, we're required in uh, for to maintain our Oregon license to do uh, TBI training, uh, continued education, um, basically every three years, two hours every three years. Uh, so that's been in place for quite a few years. Uh, really, when once I think we start getting more attention to the concussion, how how serious we need to treat concussions, um, you know, probably 10, 15 years ago. So, yep. You guys see this uh, question about does a medical provider trump an athletic trainer? Yeah. yeah I, and, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Well, I was trying to address that a little bit in that um, 
it it depends on what the athlete looks like at the time that they're processing back into return to play. So um, if a medical provider, I, the best thing for an athletic trainer to do is to write back and say, you know, it's provide the information about the impact testing. But some schools actually do have policies that say they have to have been returned back to normal before they can play. So if the school has that policy, then even if the provider says, I think medically they're cleared, they, but they also have to go through the hoop of um, actually getting their impact back, or there has to be a specific notes saying by the provider that I under, I've read the impact test, I know it's not back to baseline, and I have a logical medical reason, and they're still cleared. So there, if the school has a requirement for it to be back in place, which some schools do, then there has to be some specific wording around why it's not backed up baseline. So I think um, you're muted. Last now. call for questions. I think we're right at that time. So if you put any more questions in the chat, um, we'll get them e the answers emailed to you. Um, any last thoughts, Sam and Jim? No, yep. thanks for having us. I, you know, I yeah, get interested in the data. I think Jim said that, but I hopefully it wasn't. Uh, hopefully, people also it informs what we do next. Um, and so, I think we're doing some things really well here. But I think we've also highlighted some areas that we need to continue to work on. And I'm excited about it. Uh, just the collaborations we have and the work we can uh, continue together. Yeah, and I want to thank the OHA OHA again for reaching out to us and. Uh, OSAA for um, allowing the collaboration to reach the schools. And then, of course, Siebert's always at the core of much of what goes on uh, in concussion uh, evaluation care and you know, management and all the great policy things that they're pushing as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys both for being here today. We so appreciate it. Um, thank you all who attended. Um, you're the reason we do the webinar, so thank you. We will be sending out um, links and slides and all of that for uh, resources mentioned today, as well as the presentation. So on that note, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sam.